OK, so land use and climate change. Um, and the question is sort of, why, why am I doing this talk? My background is in writing about energy and quite specifically about oil and gas. But then, of course, I couldn't ignore what was going on. There is an energy revolution going on, um, a green energy revolution. And the more I looked at the, the figures and I looked at the climate change statistics, I kept coming across these bits, big bits, that I didn't understand, particularly this carbon dioxide, 11% uh, from forestry and other land use. Didn't quite get it. Okay, that's an awful lot of tractor emissions. What, what is it? Um, nitrous oxide. I mean, I kept reading that this was very much agriculture related, but I didn't really understand what that was, although I knew nitrous oxide is almost 300 times as powerful and as destructive as carbon dioxide for us. And then, of course, I watched Cowspiracy, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And I realised, you know, methane, again, 25 times as, as uh, powerful as carbon dioxide. And a lot of that comes from our agriculture. The film seemed to be indicating that this is at least a bigger problem as our fossil fuel consumption. And that certainly piqued my interest because I know that a lot of our methane comes from other, you know, from conventional gas sources. So I kind of wanted to dissect this. And when I looked at the UK statistics for our greenhouse emissions, again, I mean, you just can't ignore this. 24% there plus another almost 1% indirectly from agriculture, forestry, and other land use. That's 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions. That's too, too, too big a number to ignore. And then when I read the IPCC reports, um, the International Panel on Climate Change, that's our collective, um, you know, the consensus of scientists from across the world, um, and I looked at what they've put together as their representative concentration pathway. So this is the modeling for our futures. Um, they've come up with four different scenarios none of them good and the bad news is of course that we are on that worst one we're on that red one we are heading towards five four five six degrees by the end of the 21st century which at which temperatures we do not live most of the planet will not live our science our, our society will be desperately uh, destroyed round about three degrees uh, and so on so we are on target for a very very serious change human and physical geography changes, uh, and so on. And, of course, we all want to get down onto that lower pathway. Technically still possible. If we get down to it, it's te technically still possible. But from what I, when looking around, and, and the more I read about this, the re I realised that, that to do that, it involves not just our cutting our fossil fuel use uh, and switching to clean tech and all the rest of it. It also involves getting a lot of that carbon dioxide back out of the air and into what's known as our carbon sinks. And that took me to looking again at our, our, our carbon sinks and then our basic carbon cycle. And just to go back to basics, of course, this is the, the natural cycle that we've, we've kind of disrupted badly. Um, it, of course, we've always put out greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, we need them in our plan on our planet to live, for our planet to be a, a comfortable temperature. And we've always, you know, uh, forestry, vegetation has decayed, animals have put out their, their, their uh, emissions and so on. And that has been taken down quite naturally back into our oceans uh, and turned long term, very, very long term, back into sediments and then back into to rocks and so on, very, very long term, but also into our soils and our vegetation. And these are our natural carbon sinks. And it, when I went back to look at these figures, I, I actually I realised I hadn't got them. Uh, our deep ocean is by far our biggest carbon sink and, as you probably know, is suffering badly at the moment, extremely badly. Uh, we're, um, we're warming it and acidifying it uh, hugely. Uh, and to, that much energy to, to warm the deep ocean means that we have, <laughs> we've, done, uh, we've, we've really put out a lot of, lot of heat. Um, so that is around 38,000 gigatons. A gigaton is a billion tonnes uh, of CO2 into our deep ocean. And again, more than 1,000 there in the surface ocean. But soils are around more than 1,500. Okay? And vegetation, about 610. So we, um, and these are very rough figures, and of course they, they move all the time. But I hadn't realised myself just quite how big uh, a sink soil can be. Um, and I hadn't 
I mean, what that's about, what, three times, almost three times what our, veg our vegetation and our forestry. Uh, and if it's more than even our, what's out in the atmosphere and our, our vegetation together. So it's, it's a really big sink. But at the moment, it's actually emitting. Uh, it's become a, a source of emissions <coughs> rather than a carbon sink. So just, just a, a summary of, of the, those points there. Um, so soil has current, is a current uh, source um, of, of carbon. So what I'm going to do here, in the first half of the talk, I'm going to talk very much about soil. Um, and then we will take a break, and you can ask any questions at that point. During the second half, we will address the issue about forestry. Uh, and then in the last part, we may take a quick breather there, but then in the very last part, I'll address that issue about um, our livestock and... Um, and uh, whether vegetarianism, veganism is an essential part of uh, combating climate change. And soil, if I tell you I'm going to do a, half a talk on soil, it may sound very dry and dusty, but in fact, actually, it's, it's a really fascinating story. I hope you find it so. It's deeply political. I hadn't realised until I started researching this, and I have to say, this is not my area of expertise. I've had to really do a lot of learning to, to, to do this. Um, and I hadn't realised quite how much this whole thing shapes our world, shapes our economics, shapes everything that, that, uh, of how we function. So I hope you'll find it really very, very interesting. Back to the basics. Soil, um, this thing that we really just take for granted, it takes millions of years to, to <coughs> develop. And they are what soil scientists call parents parents of soil. And that's the rock, it's the glaciers, it's the rivers, everything that brings that soil together. And soil, of course, is made up of those minerals, water, air, organic matter, uh, and so on. And particularly carbon, that's the bit that we're interested in. So there's the inorganic carbon that comes, that's the minerals in the soil, and then crucially, the organic carbon, um, which is absolutely vital for the soil structure. It's what holds the water, um, it stops acidification, uh, and so on. And the incredible thing is, one very healthy teaspoon of uh, carbon-rich soil has around up to four billion microorganisms in it. One teaspoon, apparently. I thought that was incredible. And one handful <coughs> will have more than all the people on the planet. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? And we, we, we take it for granted. So there we go. So how does organic carbon get into the soil? Well, there are two main ways. And basically, our vegetation uh, has deep roots and the roots are made of carbon and when that gets chomped off by animals or, or cut off or destroyed in any other way or decays it sloughs off the, um, the roots and the roots stay in the, car in the soil, get decomposed and so on. But the main thing is the surface litter. Uh, that, that helps build up what we call the humus and, and it means that most of the organic carbon is in that top sort of 5 to 10 percent. That is the really critical live nutrient rich part of our soil and it's absolutely vital for our well-being. And it's these little bugs that we're completely uh, reliant on. Um, they're the ones who, that, uh, that are part of the cycle. They, uh, the detritus in the soil is their energy, uh, and they, they, um, they create that structure of the soil and then the, uh, you know, process the nutrients and so on. And, and yet, of course, we've been destroying our soil. We've been, and the worst thing we can do is, of course, expose or and even tip over, top over that top area of soil and expose it to the air so that the carbon becomes carbon dioxide. And that's what we've been doing. We've been deforesting, we've been burning it, we've been tilling it, uh, you know, as I say, just ploughing it. Worse, we've been compacting it when we've done that with heavy machinery or with animals. Um, and we've, um, when we compact it, we stop, we uh, allow more runoff. The, the, the water can't get absor absorbed, so more nutrients and everything else are just washed away from the soil. We've drained it. So we've done, we've done some pretty horrendous things with our soil. And in fact, we've lost a third of our topsoil in the last 100 years, as an estimate. And we've lost about 60 to 80% of the organic matter in our soil. So... Um, Pretty dire. This picture is actually from the 1930s, of course, the Great Dust Bowl of, of the Midwest in, in uh, America. If anyone remembers John Steinbeck, I had to study him at school. I don't know if anybody else did. But um, I hadn't realised quite how relevant the story was to, for today. But there we go. And you can see water leaching off uh, nutrients and, and carbon into our water system and into our air. 
And of course, the, the most sensitive lands we have, which are incredibly valuable in terms of carbon, are our peat lands. Um, only um, a third of our, is it, they contain about a third of our soil carbon, um, but they're only 2% of the global land area. And some estimates I've read are, uh, suggest that this is about 6% of all our emissions are from peat. I took these pictures in Ireland, actually, earlier this year, and you can see how, you know, how wet the land is and how the, the peat is being taken out. Remember that peat is a few, God knows how many millennia, off becoming coal. It is almost a fossil fuel. It's the precursor of coal. So when you think of dirty coal and how bad it is to burn that, this is the early version, which is even worse. Um, Ireland, of course, uses a lot, uh, and it's very traditional. I have Irish relatives, and uh, they would tell, you, tell me that it's part of their culture to do so. In Finland, they actually burn peat in power stations to produce electricity. I think they're the only European country that does. Um, and I think the IPCC has now renamed uh, peat as a, a slow renewable, and that's because it has this... I don't, I'm not a soil biologist or chemist myself, so I, this, I have to repeat what I have learned, which is it's the, 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 the uh, plants that uh, proliferate in the peat, particularly the sphagnum moss, moss, that captures the carbon dioxide, and because it decomposes it in these anaerobic conditions in the water, that's what makes it a natural, very efficient carbon sink. It actually builds about a millimetre per year. Um, so on. But it makes them very, very vulnerable. Just as they're a great carbon sink, they're a great carbon source if you do this to it. And of course, Indonesia is, is really the, the absolute uh, example of how this can go so badly wrong. You've probably all heard about the forest fires that have been going on every year for the last 20 years in Indonesia. And you can see here the smoke billowing across to uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore. In fact, this picture here is taken in Singapore. So this is every summer now in Southeast Asia. They are suffering with these massive fires coming across. And it's from palm oil production. They're clearing the land. Um, the trouble is, it's not just deforestation. Under those forests, there's peat. And that peat can burn for months, if not years. Years. Um, and so it just literally keeps smouldering and keeps burning. This is the uh, Prime Minister Joko Widodo going to visit, and he's promised a bit of a clean-up, uh, but it, nothing will improve for about three years, he says. Um, it's really a story about poverty. It's at the big company. Most of the fires are on smallholder land, uh, and they lease it out. There's a lot of corruption involved, um, but to our big palm oil producers, the companies that... We, and in fact, we'll come back to this when we talk about forestry. Um, and that's, that's what's happening. But, but that makes Indonesia put out more greenhouse gas emissions than America for, I think, almost 30 days last year. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's made it, I think, the fourth biggest emitter in the world, and it's the peat and the deforestation that's doing it. And we shouldn't feel too smug. We have also messed up our peatlands. It's about 8% of our uh, land area, and we've damaged them hugely, and they are still a source of carbon emissions. Actually, having said that, I think they have just, they have just come, become a, a carbon store, a small carbon store, because we have started to restore them uh, on a small scale, but we're re-wetting some of our peatlands and getting the, the carbon back in. But of course, the bottom line is don't use peat in your horticulture and so on. And the RSPB and English Nature, I think, have got a big campaign called Petering Out to stop you doing so. Um, OK, carbon. OK, but so now let's look at um, nitrous oxide. This, again, is one that I didn't understand, although I read that, you know, it's 298 times as powerful. It has the global warming potential of, of carbon dioxide. So it's a huge one. And you can see here, almost entirely, it comes from agriculture, agricultural byproducts and land use and biomass. So it's a really, really important one. And this, this bit I find absolutely fascinating. Maybe old news to you, maybe you all know it, but I hadn't realised, OK, we all need nitrogen in our bodies. It's for our DNA, it's for our proteins, our, our cell structure and so on. And in a sense, the good news is, hey, 78% of our, the air we breathe in has got nitrogen in it. But we can't access that nitrogen. We can't, it's inert. Our bodies cannot use that oxygen, nor can animals, nor can plants. 
The only way we can get access to that nitrogen, which we absolutely need, is through crop residues and through manure, once it's been through an animal, um, going into the, uh, into the soil and those bugs in the soil processing it, splitting those at atoms and fixing the nitrogen so that it can be taken up by new crops, which we eat or the animals eat and then we eat the animals. That's how we get our nitrogen. This is essential for our life. Um, yeah, so it, it's quite, a, a, quite a, I, I just hadn't got this at all. It's called the nitrogen cycle. Um, and of course, anybody who's a gardener will know, or a, a plant grower will know that there are some plants, we call them nitrogen fixing plants, they're mainly the peas, beans and legumes, that are particularly, they live in a symbiotic relationship with some of the bacteria. They, they uh, are particularly good at fixing the nitrogen so that it can be used by other crops. And what we hadn't realised when we started sort of mass planting of cereal crops was we hadn't understood this this thing at all about the need for nitrogen and um, farmers didn't understand why after a couple of years their yields were going down and down and we'd always got through it around it in the past without actually knowing the science by using manure on the land or by um, rotating and planting nitrogen fixing crops like clover so uh, you know farmers 200 years ago didn't understand what they were doing but they knew it worked so by uh, basically by changing our, our uh, land management, we were just depleting the land of nitrogen. Um, and then, again, I've just put this in, and if anybody wants to read, this is a really good um, uh, short article on the political history of nitrogen. And I had, honestly, I hadn't realised this. The First World War wasn't just about getting access to oil in the, with the Berlin-Baghdad railway, it was about access to uh, guano in South America. You know, we were fighting um, the Germans over that. And it was because we knew we needed that manure. We discovered how good it was on the land and how it improved productivity. And then this guy, Fritz Haber, um, he was a, a chemist in Germany, I believe a, a German Jew. And he discovered the link with the nitrogen of, he was the one who started uh, chemical warfare, of course, de developing chemical weapons. In fact, tragically, his wife, uh, who was also a chemist, um, wouldn't be party to it, and she shot herself. Um, and I believe those chemicals were, of course, what went on to, to kill so many Jews in the Second World War. So it's really quite an intricate history, uh, and it's um, quite, quite something. So I really would recommend reading it, if you, if you can. Very short one. But, of course, what we did was um, we... we um, discovered that we could, we could produce synthetic nitrogen fertilisers. And that kind of seemed to solve the problem. So we've been blasting them all over the place. Um, we've also been using animal manure, but not very cleverly. And that has been a large part of the runoff. One way or another, um, we've used so much nitrogen on the land, um, with the, plus that compaction and so on, we've got a real problem with nitrogen leaching. In fact, one estimate I read said that only about 20% of the nitrogen we put on the land is actually used, is actually usefully uh, used in our, our, our crop growing. So the rest of it, where's it going? Well, it's going into our, uh, into our rivers and into our sea, and we'll come on to that in a minute. There is now a move towards, your, and you'll hear it discussed on Farming Today, I podcast, which I'd recommend to anybody, because um, it's really quite an inside uh, look at what's happening. Um, but it's uh, this look at, you know, uh, GPS uh, tractor systems and so on, so that nitrogen is much more targeted. Um, and, of course, farmers now are waking up to the idea of using nitrogen fixing crops to intercrop uh, and so on. And we'll come back to that. But our global nitrogen use has... has, has uh, expanded dramatically it's everywhere now and of course I don't know if anybody remembers we had massive food riots around the world in 2007 2008 when there was mass hunger everywhere and that was largely to do with the cost of um, fertilizers going up um, and of course led uh, partly to the Arab Spring and so on and so many other political developments that we're dealing with now but um, so it's, it's very very relevant and just before we we sort of finish up that story Nitrogen is not the only uh, issue here when it comes to climate change and fertilisers. Um, phosphorus, as any gardener knows, you'll have MPK, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium in your fertiliser. And phosphorus, 
Uh, we have to get out of the, the rock with sulfuric acid and so on. But there's a real issue here. Morocco has 85% of the world's supplies. And actually not Morocco, it's Western Sahara, which Morocco annexed in 1976. So we have a real issue about long-term security. And with this is the whole world is dependent upon this stuff to produce food, okay? If we, you know, we're so uh, dependent on our fertilizers, you know, if this stops, uh, we, we're in big trouble. Um, apparently, the UK has got some stores, but they're under Cambridge. So unless we're prepared to mine under Cambridge, uh, we're stuck. Or the other option is that we start reclaiming it from sewage, which I'm sure we will do, but, we, um, but the, there is a difficulty in getting enough. Of course, back to climate change, the trouble is that this nitrogen and the phosphorus runoff has created these whopping great algae blooms around the world, red tides, green tides, they're highly toxic to us and to marine life. I don't know what happened to this little boy the next day, whether he survived uh, and so on. But, um, but they are everywhere and the, the, again what happens is these proliferate, they're, they're fed with the nitrogen and the phosphorus and then when they collapse um, the bacteria that eat them use up an awful lot of oxygen in the water and uh, upset the whole balance. So it's, it's adding to the acidification of the oceans. So again, these are a real problem. Anyway, our fertiliser use is, of course, on the increase. Um, this is a little bit out of date, but it shows the European countries. The UK is about sixth or seventh from the, right, from the left there. We're obviously not the worst, but we're, we're certainly up there amongst the top users. And it's projected to increase uh, for, for some considerable time. And just uh, thinking back about climate change and energy use, fertiliser manufacture, it's not so much the, the energy involved in manufacturing the fertilisers, it's the feedstock, which is usually natural gas now. Now that natural gas is quite cheap, natural gas, i.e. methane, um, we're using that as a feedstock to, to get the stuff we need. And... Uh, there's at one estimate that this is three to five percent of our global emissions. So fertilizer is a, you know, it's a really big issue. And of course, what it's done, this use of synthetic fertilizers have enabled us to develop monocultures at vast scale. Uh, you know, this is an absolute transformation of our landscapes around the world. It's made us incredibly dependent on a few plant species and a few animal species. Um, it's made us less adaptable to change because it's very hard to come off this. It's a bit like a drug. You know, if you stop using it, the land is, is not very fertile for several years until it recovers. Um, it means that we use a lot more pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, uh, and so on, because you want to make sure you've got, you know, once one disease gets going, you've got a really big problem when you've got a big monoculture. Uh, and of course, we're getting more resistance in all of those. Uh, it's... Uh, absolutely destroyed our, or destroying our biodiversity and our pollination services and so on. And I don't know if anybody has seen on, on YouTube or any documentaries, I mean, heaven help us if we get there, but in China, you know, they're now having to send scores of people up trees with the little brushes going from blossom to blossom and pollinating themselves, pollinating, hand pollinating the trees because they have lost their pollinators. You know, and I'm sure you all know we have a real bee crisis uh, in this country and so on. So, you know, let's just hope we don't get there. Um, it's also incredibly water intensive, reduced nutrients. You probably know that, you know, these days you have to eat about eight tomatoes for every, <coughs> to get the nutrients that you would have had from one tomato back in 19, the 1940s. So our food is very nutrient poor um, and that, that affects all of us. Farming today is very debt intensive. Talk to any farmer in this country or in India or wherever you like, they will be indebted um, because they have to pay out for these uh, chemicals and their tractors to apply them and everything else uh, up front. They're usually mortgaged up to the hilt uh, and so on. We have food safety issues uh, that arise from this. We have the dominance of a few food, food companies, and of course at the moment we have the amalgamation of more of them. Uh, they're rounding up into, into smaller, um, smaller Monsantos being taken over and so on. Um, you know, it's not a, not a healthy way to go. It's, I mean, I guess this just can't be ignored. We, it, what it's done, it's pushed so many people off the land. Now we've kind of got used to that in this country, we're a very urbanised world, but in developing countries, 
they're still dealing with it, this mass movement off the land into urban centres. And what it's leaving behind is a very aged workforce. I mean, I was in Ghana, I was doing some research there a couple of years ago, and it's a real problem. Anybody who likes chocolate should be worried because Ghana is one of our biggest chocolate producers, Ghana and Ivory Coast. Um, and yet, really, all the young people have left the land. They're in the cities they, and it's a, a very older population. It's a very, uh, you know, there, there are umpteen problems with, again, with that massive mon monoculture. This picture is actually from the potato famine, um, which is just a very good example of what happens when you're dependent on one crop um, and you don't have the defences against it. So it's really changed our world. I've just picked this one out. I mean, obviously, there are many big, uh, massive crops. But it's just when you look at the figures, US corn uh, is a really big issue. Now, you may say, as, a, as environmentalists, it's great because we use it for bioethanol, which we do, or the Americans do. Um, and it saves, I think, uh, it's the carbon emissions of about 20 million vehicles per year. The trouble is we're now feeding it to fish. Uh, we're now, you know, we're feeding corn to everything. If anybody hasn't seen the film Food Inc, please see it. Uh, in fact, we may, I may even try and get a screening of it here. It's a, it's a few years old now, but it, it really shows the issues, the food safety issues and so on, the E. coli and all the rest of it um, that, that results from this. So it's a really fascinating issue. But this is just one of our monocrops. And you can see the figures here are enormous. Of course, our pesticide use is, is huge, as is our herbicide use, and as I said, a lot of resistance. Um, actually, I found this quite fascinating. Colombia is way up there, and in fact, Costa Rica is off the scale, and I can't quite work out why. Um, the blurb says it's because, the more, obviously, the more valuable the crop, the more you're likely to use pesticides, and it explains that Co Colombia farms a lot of tulips and coffee. I did sort of think about the cocaine <laughs> and just wonder whether how much of that pesticide is being used on cocaine crops but anyway there we go um, it's it's surprising which countries are using an awful lot of this stuff one way or another we have massive soil degradation okay we have a real problem um, and that's you can see in our country too uh, as well as all around the world and just looking just briefly at our, um, our UK land use, this is actually all our land use. Um, if I could break that down quickly for you, about 70% of our agricultural land in this country is used for grazing. Okay, we feed, we, we use it for livestock. And of the 30% of agricultural land left, half of that land is used to produce feed for the animals. Okay, so livestock production is really uh, a really big issue in the UK um, and we've just had a, 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 we actually have a parliamentary committee on soil which is a, a new one on me um, and what they are saying is we are devastating a lot of our soil in fact um, the eastern side of the country in particular is likely to be unprofitable unproductive within the very near foreseeable future we're losing around three million tons of topsoil per year when we say losing it, we mean that that carbon is going up into the air um, and so on. So uh, that's adding to our carbon dioxide. Um, the government has said that all soils will be managed sustainably by 2030 and the committee is saying we're not seeing the action. Okay, good words, but we're not seeing the action. And just, uh, this actually, I was surprised, this actually was addressed at COP21, which was the Paris meeting last December, where climate change was, uh, was of course, the big, the big agreement where all um, countries signed up. And um, we uh, did agree, obviously the land use issue was addressed there, and we agreed a 0.4% increase in soil carbon per year. Um, the Soil Association is saying we need at least 1%. <coughs> so we've got a long way to go, and it appears that we're not, not doing it at the moment. We're not, we're not anywhere near there. Okay. And just looking, I mean, obviously, just I, I put these slides in because I assume that, you know, obviously everybody here is interested in what, what is the UK doing. Um, and biodiversity is a really good indicator of the quality of our soils and, and where we are. And unfortunately, it's just not looking good. And Actually, what shocked me was I thought, well, OK, since the 1970s, maybe we've done a lot of damage. But surely in the last five, ten years, we must have repaired a lot of that. But in fact, all the indicators are either neutral or negative, um, which is a real shame. And when you look specifically at our soil carbon, actually, our forest carbon, we are reforesting a little. 
Okay, and we'll come on to that in the second half when we talk about forestry. But we are, we are increasing our, our forest stocks and that is an improvement. But our soil carbon, uh, again, sort of no change really since the over the 1978 to 2007 period and no data available more recently than that, which is slightly worrying. But I mean, many of you will have heard a report just a couple of weeks ago, um, sort of saying basically that how the east of uh, Britain is looking very infertile and with, you know, uh, looking very negative. Anyway, so um, the question is, how do we turn our soils back into being a positive carbon sink? How do we get that? We need to get that carbon back down in the soils. We have carbon depleted soils. The first thing, of course, is protection and restoration of our peatlands. Absolutely essential. We've got to move from tillage farming, farming. And in fact, actually, I happen to have the archers, which I don't normally listen to, but I had it on for a few minutes today. And uh, it's obviously being discussed on the archers, and I can I can tell you it's certainly being discussed on um, on uh, farming today. So this idea that we don't turn over the soil and that you don't expose it, and when you have exposed it, you cover it. You don't leave it exposed to the air uh, and the rain. We obviously need to cut our fertilizer and pesticide use. Use more cover cropping. So one thing, rather than just this, covering the soil, is obviously to put in those nitrogen fixing plants to actually cover the soil and do some, uh, do some good, uh, particularly over winter. Um, more woodland, and we'll come on to that, and the role of woodland in actually preserving our soils. Uh, we'll come on to that. Better targeting in fertilisers, okay, using that GPS and satellites and so on. And intercropping. So actually, we're, instead of having an absolute monoculture, putting in, again, usually nitrogen fixing crops in between our wheat or barley or whatever it is, or rapeseed uh, and so on. Okay, and of course the big question is, okay, everyone, you know, the sceptics will say, yeah, but we can't feed people. We've got 7.3 billion people on the planet and we're heading towards 9 billion. We've got to keep using this stuff because otherwise we're not going to feed everyone. Okay, we're not feeding everyone now, so uh, let's get real. But, um, but I think the shocking statistics are that we have such a huge amount of waste. This is really... The problem of feeding people seems to me more an issue about distribution uh, and how we allocate food rather than actually our production. One in four calories are completely lost. Uh, and I guess that's what's eaten. That's probably not including the overconsumption, which is equally wasteful. Um, so it's just something, I mean, obviously we've got a lot of campaigns on in this country to stop food waste and they are really, really essential. And of course, particularly because food waste, if it goes into landfill, is also a source of, source of methane. So, you know, we have a double problem there. Oh, did I miss one there? Yes. Okay. Um, I think this is something that we, again, we will talk a, a, more about in the second half. But we, but I think anybody looking at the ball statistics can see that we're not using our land, our agricultural land, very effectively at the moment. If you need seven to 10 kilos of cereal to produce one kilo of meat, it's not a good use. And as I say, 70% of our land at the moment, our agricultural land, is being used for grazing. Um, so yeah, 26% of the world's land surface, for heaven's sake, is grazing. So this is not, not a good use of resources. Um, we'll come on, as I say, to talk about the whole livestock issue, but do keep those figures in your head. If we go up at the moment, of course, the world's meat consumption is going up hugely, and that's not just to do with an increase in population. As countries like China, India become wealthier, their meat consumption is increasing, just as ours has. Okay, so, okay, but you know, you may say, and many people do, but what's the alternative? Organic farming just can't feed everyone. And the extraordinary thing is, and I've looked at several reports on this, is that actually it pretty much can. It's certainly more profitable than the farming that we're stuck with at the moment. And um, there is certainly, when you come off this system, which you've been spraying for years, the soil is going to absolutely go down in fertility for quite a while, for a few years. But actually, organic farming now is very science driven um, and the research seems to show, and if anybody's read, uh, I would recommend highly Shiva Vandani, the, um, the uh, uh, Indian campaigner who campaigns on, on this issue in particular, on, on better management of soil and feeding people. And she's passionate about feeding people in India. Uh, and, uh, and she comes out on, on saying this is actually the best way to do it. 
But OK, just look at the, the UK statistics at the moment. Only 3% of our land is formed or farmed organically. And almost all of that actually is pasture. I was surprised by that. Um, it's almost all. So when you're buying your organic milk or whatever, it's great. Uh, or organic meat, that's fantastic. But actually, we, we uh, farm very little. We import, of course, a lot of organic produce, but we farm very little. And I presume this is to do with uh, lack of support for the conversion process. Because obviously, in that bit when farmers are coming off traditional, conventional pesticide use, they need support to move to a, a better, more sustainable farming system. And we've never offered great support for farmers for that. In fact, organic uh, produce is very popular. About 65% of consumers say they buy some, but it's usually only very occasional pieces. It's um, you know one bottle of milk, whatever. So it's actually a small part of the market share, but increasing. Um, so in conclusion, I mean, uh, farming in the UK really is in a problem. It has a problem. It's um, we have a problem with. Uh, young workers not being able to get on the land, not having access to the land. It's mainly, most of our farmers are of a certain age and getting older. Um, profitability, and I mean, again, you all know, you've heard the stories about our dairy farmers in this country and so on. Most of them, are, many of them are going out of business. Um, we're sort of conglomerating into bigger and bigger uh, farms uh, and so on. But uh, so we have some, some real problems with, with farming in this country. This is actually showing one thing that farmers are apparently doing is, although not going organic, but going no tillage um, or reducing their tillage. And um, you probably can't see very clearly, but this line here is the level of reduced tillage farms. And that's gone up quite a lot since the, the late 90s. And the conventional ploughing has gone down quite a lot. Production has sort of wobbled around, but hasn't really changed that much over, over the over that period. It's sort of gone up and down. But uh, there we are. It just shows that change can happen. OK, so just, just to roll, roll up this bit about uh, soil. It's a vital carbon sink. Our health depends on it. I mean, I think that's the extraordinary thing. We need those little bugs in the soil. We actually need them. <laughs> And we haven't managed it well. And we can't blame the farmers. We've all demanded cheap, cheap food. Um, so, you know, that's what we've got. Um, I think the trouble is, like energy, food is something we don't value. I suspect, I know I'm guilty of this. If you ask me with the price of a thing of butter or whatever, I probably couldn't tell you offhand. We are sort of out of touch with actually how much we spend on food as we are with energy. We've sort of it's just become a part of our background expense uh, and so on. Um, and one way, the only way to change this really is to sort of change the economics, really. We've got to kind of get back in touch with what's, what's valuable to us and, and what makes us healthy. Um, but certainly change is happening and the food industry is having to change. I mean, there was a report just a couple of months ago in the Financial Times about how the food industry really is shaken up at the moment. About 20% of all new product launches are organic. Actually, and I have to say it's the young people who are really changing things, you know, demanding low salt, low pesticide, low, low additives uh, and so on, um, sugar free and so on. And uh, it's interesting, consumer pressure works and the whole food industry is really having to think fast and move on this. Um, so, so there we are. Okay, a quick breather if anybody wants to get a coffee and then we'll go on. In this, this half, I'm going to look at particularly at forestry and then try and address the, the very difficult question about our livestock production and um, whether vegetarianism will help uh, at all. So just going back to that carbon cycle and looking at our, our vegetation and forestry in particular. So it's our sort of third carbon sink. And actually, I was surprised actually how small it was compared to, to the other two. Uh, and of course, there's a reason for that. Um, which is that we have, unfortunately, destroyed most of the world's forests. Uh, the UN puts it at 80%. So basically, that working bit uh, is really as lost, uh, according to the UN. So we have about 20% of the world's forests left. Uh, and, of course, those are also under threat. Um, and the reason that the... the, the let's just go through the, the science of it. The trees are so uh, useful for us is... And again, excuse me if I'm, I'm saying the, the flipping obvious, but it was kind of, I needed it reinforcing. 
Trees and crops take carbon dioxide from the air, not from the soil. Um, they take the nutrients and the water from the soil, but the carbon dioxide comes from the air. And that's what they need to build their biomass uh, and so on. And they, um, as they die, uh, as they, they release their carbon again, either into the air or into the soil in decom decomposition. And this, this, uh, this tree here, so uh, you know, one tonne of carbon is roughly this, a, a 12 metre sycamore. So I don't know if you can see there, there's a woman there uh, and she's just illustrating what one tonne of carbon might look like. And actually I wanted to, uh, just a side issue, I thought I'd better, I want to work out how much carbon I've got, how does this compare? And um, I looked up and apparently a human is about 18% carbon. Uh, and so for uh, the average 70 kilo body, we each are about 12 to 13 kilos of carbon. Very good reason to be buried rather than burned when you, when you go. But, um, but uh, there we go, we're a long way off, uh, off a big tree. Uh, and of course, a lot of that is below level, most of it above. Um, and the other reason I want to look at it is because, right, I, I've had solar panels on my house for almost exactly a year. And this is, I, like anybody else who's got solar panels, I can see on the web how much solar I'm producing and so on, and how many light bulbs I've saved and whatever. And I've saved almost ab about um, a, a thousand kilograms of, of, of carbon dioxide since over, over the year. And that's the equivalent to almost eight and a half thousand light bulbs powered for a day. Okay, so I've done really well. But the extraordinary thing is, so that, um, that is the equivalent of only about 3.6 trees planting, growing. And I think what, what that does is illustrate how powerful trees are. It's not that the, the solar panels aren't doing a fantastic job, they are, and light bulbs obviously don't use a huge amount, but trees are really, really powerful in getting carbon out of the air. And forests have another great plus for us. Uh, it's the forest soils. Um, they can contain four times the amount of carbon that's actually in the trees. So it's all that leaf litter decomposing, sitting there in that, making that humus uh, and so on, all that organic carbon. And they, of course, you can lose that carbon by, by disturbing that soil, uh, by cutting the trees, whatever, you, you know, uh, by felling, by drainage and so on. Um, but they are a really, really good resource, not just for the carbon in the trees, but, in, but for the soil. And when a tree reaches its mature state, of course, it, it becomes sort of carbon neutral in the sense of um, how much carbon it takes in and, and how much it respires out. But it, obviously, while a tree is growing, it's actually a really good carbon sink for us. Interestingly, and I had to double check this, rainforest soil is very different. So the, the soil uh, is very different to sort of a mixed broadleaf forest that we might have in this country. I thought it would be incredibly nutrient rich, um, you know, all that biodiversity and stuff humming around in a, a rainforest. But because of the heavy rainfall, that's not true. And apparently it's only, it only has a very thin topsoil. So all this rainforest that we're clearing for agricultural land, in fact most of that land is very unproductive after a couple of years without artificial inputs. So, um, you know, another good reason to leave it alone really. Okay, so we've destroyed 80% of our forests and the rest are pretty much under threat and this is extreme threat. Now I knew about Brazil, I think everybody knows about Brazil. Um, I'd heard about the Democratic Republic of Congo and of course about Indonesia. I didn't realise Nigeria was a real issue, Bolivia, North Korea. These are considered extreme, um, at extreme risk states. Okay, and I had to uh, double check this. In, oh, so how, the question is, how, how are we losing forest? What are we doing to it? Fire, of course, is one. It's a really big one. And I had to check what a teragram is. And that is, actually, I'm going to have to double check it. It is, that is over 2,000, 2,300 trillion grams of carbon lost last year in, or lost each year in forest fires. So that's a huge amount. I, I tried to convert that into kilograms. I think it's a million, million kilograms. Um, but I can't quite work out how many zeros that is, but it's an awful lot. And this is, I mean, I just happened to take this shot from a public website in, from America, from the west of, of the United States, back a couple of months ago. And that's just public notification of the number of fires going on at that time. Okay, so it's, it's a really big issue. So fire is, is incredible. 
destroyer. We've also got the problem, of course, of monocultures of woodland. Um, and again, this is from North America. This is bark beetle. It's absolutely decimating the forests in, in North America. Um, but of course, there are many other examples like of that, of ash dieback in our own country and so on, which we will come on to. But the really main issue, the main look at why, why are we destroying so much woodland, and it's because crops or livestock have more value. We haven't valued woodland. It doesn't contribute to the world economy, um, so why would you keep it? You, you're going to fell it and, and do something else with the land, and that's exactly what's been happening. And, of course, just going back to one example, and it is the most uh, potent one at the moment, this issue about palm oil in Indonesia, and again, you've probably seen all the petitions signed half a dozen, uh, you know, this week alone. But palm oil is in half of our, all our supermarket products, products. It's what makes our chocolate shiny and our ice cream shiny. It's in motor oil. It's in crisps. It's in absolutely almost everything that we buy. Um, and the reason is because these palm oil fruits, you can get about 10 times the oil out of them than you could from soya or, or most other forest products. And uh, of course, we're you know we're so we're taking down the rainforest and replacing it with these lovely plantations of palm oil. Um, there is a move now to have certified palm producers uh, responsibly uh, sourcing, um, and uh, so you need to look for these signs. This one means that they're working towards it, but uh, you know. Uh, obviously nothing is good and obviously the history in Indonesia is that this is very very hard to police. Quite a little bit of good news for you or mixed news shall I say. Um, we have attempted to put some value on forests that we want to preserve and I thought this was first of all when I read that Norway was taking the lead, lead in this I thought that this was Norway's sovereign wealth fund. You may know um, that sovereign uh, that Norway has a sovereign wealth fund of about 900 billion. This is savings from their oil and gas exports that as a population of 4 million they haven't been able to use, so they have stuck it in a kitty for their long term. No Norwegian has to worry about their state pension. They are phenomenally rich. Um, we didn't do it, we spent it on unemployment benefit. But there we go. Um, anyway, so Norway, but I, so I thought this was, so I'm digressing a bit, I thought that this was the Sovereign Wealth Fund doing it, but apparently it's not, it's the Rainforest Alliance, uh, which was set up by Trudy and um, Sting, uh, the pop stars. Uh, so they set it up a, a couple of decades ago, anybody of my age will remember um, Sting's work in the rainforest in South America. But anyway, so it's a charity and they're obviously getting a lot of corporate funding. They attempted to uh, pay Indonesia a billion dollars to save its rainforest. Now it hasn't actually worked, um, that, but it, literally because the money has, it, it, the corruption thing has, has fangled it. But they have done it in Brazil and that the money was there, was put into a separate fund so it was very accountable and very uh, visible what was happening. And you can see here the amount of deforestation in Brazil has come right down. It really has had a big impact. Um, Norway has now signed, uh, uh, and now I'm not sure if this is the government or the Rainforest Alliance, but anyway, they have signed uh, an agreement with the Democratic Republic of Congo to help preserve some of their forests, and the UK has contributed some to that. Uh, and similarly, it, uh, certainly at a government level, we're now helping, uh, or Norway is helping with um, Liberia uh, in exchange for Norwegian aid. So there are measures to try and improve, uh, to try and put some value and protect these forests. Um, this one didn't work. Um, Ecuador discovered that it had oil uh, under a very sensitive part of its uh, rainforest. Now, this area has even still, I believe, still got some uncontacted tribes, um, which is really quite extraordinary in this day uh, and age. And the Ecuadorian government asked for funding to leave this oil alone. Um, they said, if you value it, if you don't want us to, to if you value the forest, um, and you don't want us to touch them and build all the roads and everything else that would be necessary for the infrastructure for the oil industry, um, pay us. Uh, pay us 3.6 billion, which actually is not a huge amount in global terms, um, to leave that behind. But whatever happened, it didn't, it didn't happen. Um, and I don't know whether the world didn't like being asked for money. There's certainly reports, news reports, about being held over a barrel by the Ecuadorian government and so on. But it seems one way or another we kind of quite like paying for it if we initiate it, but don't like being asked for it. I, it seems to be the 
the, the feeling. Um, and it, in fact, only about 300 million was pledged, and now the project's abandoned and the forest is being cut through. Um, this, in fact, this, uh, this, I've just put this up here. I hadn't heard of them before. The World Land Trust, uh, with David Attenborough as a, as a patron, and they do still buy up chunks of land in sensitive areas around the world to help preserve it. So there are initiatives to sort of put a price on the forest and, and to, to take care of it. Um, and there is, I don't want to depress you too much, there is a lot going on. There, if you look on the web, honestly, I really would recommend just digging around, plug in Google, um, you know, Forestation Africa, Afforestation Africa, whatever, and you'll come up with lots and lots of sites, extraordinary things about trying to green the desert in the North African section uh, and forestry projects throughout the, the continent. There is a lot going on. Um, this one was a really big initiative approved by the African Union, but doesn't seem to have really kicked off. It was the Great Green Wall of Africa to, to try and stop the um, further desertification of the, of the encroachment of the, Sahel, uh, the Sahara into the Sahel. Um, and I, I mean, I've highlighted this because, I, again, I just think, crikey, are we aware of this? The UN is predicting, at the rate we're going, two-thirds of African arable land will be desertified by 2025. I mean, if we think we have a migration problem now, <laughs> you know, uh, Wow, we better wake up, I think. Um, but this hasn't really worked, and as far as I know, very little has been built beyond of, the, of this great green wall, this, this whopping great uh, line of trees uh, past Senegal. Um, I know there is some reforestation in Ethiopia, but I don't know whether it's part of this project, and, I, and they certainly don't link up by a long, long way. And just in case we were feeling a little bit like this isn't our problem, of course, the UK is one of the most deforested countries in Europe. We only have about 13%, and that's improved in the last couple of years, um, whereas the European average is about 37%. So we are a very, very deforested country. And actually, I'd say an awful lot of our 13% is up in Scotland. Um, so, uh, you know, we've got the Forest of Dean, uh, you know, the, the New Forest, uh, a lot of Surrey in the southeast is forested, but, but really not that much else. Um, and if you look at our, our um, emissions from land use, I mean, we are... So basically, this line here, this dark blue line, is the emissions from our cropland. And that's cropland and... Uh, no, sorry, just cropland. So that's our tilling, our farming practices and so on. We are emitting carbon from our land, OK? But our forestry at the moment is negating a lot of that and in fact since the early 2000s our land use has generally been a sink more than it has been an emitter so the net balance at the moment is in our favour so when all our emissions are calculated for the UK um, we have at the moment we can take off about five million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent whichever gas uh, per year because we are really because of our forestry. So there we are, They're just, just to round that up. So um, our cropland is our main emitter. Use of peat is a major part of that. Forestry, our main sink. But look at the, how much is in our forest soils. Four times as much as, um, as uh, is actually in the forestry. It's a huge amount. We've started reforesting. We've had last year around another 10,000 hectares added. The Committee of Climate Change is saying we need at least that every year. Um, Actually, surprisingly, our government has said, I heard on farming today, that we will be planting, or they plan, a planting of about 11 million trees by the end of the parliament. Now, that may be partly because of this, ash dieback, of course, which is, um, in fact, these projections are very out of date. This, this projection shows that ash dieback, which is a third, 30% of our forests, um, will stay largely confined to the southeast. But of course, um, we've had this year about 20 major outbreaks in the southwest, and it is now looking like we will lose all our ash in the southwest too within the next 5, 10, 15 years. So that's, a, you know, 30, as I say, 30% of, of our woodland. And this is what it looks like. Now, this is, I think, fascinating and a, a possible hope, and it links back to where we were at the beginning. It, it, again, I, I'd suggest that you go home and Google um, biochar ash dieback, and what you'll probably come up with is a, a clip of film from uh, Countryfile of um, Tom Heap 
going around and, and looking at this experiment. And in fact, it wasn't intended as an experiment. Basically, they have found out by accident that by adding biochar, which is a charcoal which helps fertilise the soil, that, they, that we can protect ash trees. They, they literally had applied it for completely other reasons. And then they discovered that all the trees around it were dying of ash dieback, but not the trees that had had biochar applied. Um, and I think this, again, it just goes back to that issue about that there's so many things that we don't understand, but soil fertility is really crucial. And that obviously is pro pro uh, proving to be a great um, defence here. So buy, go and buy a bag of biochar and throw it around every ash tree you can see is the bottom line. We obviously have other problems. If anybody's heard George Monbiot or read him, um, you'll know that uh, there is a, you know, he highlights the issue about the fact that we have got rid of, we are one of the few European countries that's got rid of all our major predators. So we have a real problem with sheep, deer, squirrels, and so on, destroying our trees. In fact, of course, he refers to um, our sheep as the white plague or the white devil. We let them roam everywhere. Our uplands, you know, we think of them as sort of dramatic and beautiful. All the, you know, Yorkshire, Derbyshire Dales, the moors and so on. In fact, they're all an ecological disaster. They have soil this thin. They have very little biodiversity uh, and so on. Um, and so his, his argument is that we should rewild. You know, we should allow land to go back to its native state and we should reintroduce some predators. So, uh, you know, that's very controversial. Not, not the, the sheep farmers are very against it, but, uh, you know, I think it's something that we have to think about. So just a conclusion on this bit. I mean, I think the bottom line is at the moment we need to... Effectively, we need to find more economic value in our woodland um, and we, in order to incentivise more. I don't think... You know, it's the long-term issue, uh, it's the, or it's not the long-term solution, shall I say. But certainly in the short term, one way or another, we have got to start growing more woodland. It is very valuable for us, and we need to get that carbon out of the air. I believe about 20% of our new homes at the moment are timber construction, which is quite, quite a, a surprising thing to me. George Monbiot's argument is that, you know, we need to rewild a lot of these areas and open them up. You know, there'll be much more tourism, shooting, all those kind of things. People will find new value in, uh, in the land as it, you know, uh, if it's uh, turned back to a natural state. And just, I've just put this in, just because obviously there are lots of organisations involved in reforestering. If anybody wanted to volunteer, there are dozens. Trees for Life up in Scotland, um, the Forestry Commission, Woodland Trust, they all, you know, you can go and plant trees for a month or a week or a day at a time or whatever. Um, you can carbon offset uh, and plant more trees. And if anybody hasn't discovered it yet, Ecosia, it's just, I mean, it's not going to save the world at all, but I like it as a very simple little little token gesture it's a search engine you can use instead of google it's just as effective uh, and every time you use it you know you add to, they will plant trees for you i think they're way over five million at the moment so so use the cozier rather than google simple as that okay all right so there we are with forestry does anybody want to ask any questions on that Okay, so, so in this section, I'm just going to tackle that issue about livestock and, and vegetarianism and so on. Um, and so let's, let's be absolutely clear. The biggest impact on, of livestock is the clearance of land for its pasture and for its crop production. Okay, so almost all our, our livestock at the moment is fed cereals. For that, we need a vast amounts of land. And so we also need the pasture land. So, and that is estimated, I think, at about 9%. So of that 11%, 9% is clearance of land for, for, <coughs> for livestock. Uh, I guess the other 2% is tractor emissions or, or something. But um, there we go. And, of course, anybody who's watched Cowspiracy will want to know about methane. And so I've really tried to nail this. So methane is 16% um, of world greenhouse gases, a very, very powerful one. But... I think the thing in the film, and I've watched it twice, but not for a while, is that he doesn't differentiate between where methane comes from. And of course, methane comes largely from our fossil fuel use, from our natural gas use. Every time you turn on the cooker, your gas cooker, and it lets out gas for a, a few seconds before you light it, that's methane. Okay, that's methane going up into the air. Okay, so, um, so, so I tried to find out, I tried to isolate how much of that 16% methane really is agriculture. 
And the statistics I came up with is, and it is a declining proportion, is that, but you know, you probably can't see the grade there, but the top level is around 54%, and the bottom level here is about 40%. So, but that's, that's agricultural methane. That's not just from livestock. Okay, so that includes, that certainly includes animal waste and animal emissions, but it also includes rice production, which is a big one, um, and other, other issues. So let's just, let's just be clear. This <coughs> rice is one that, again, I kept sort of reading about it, but reading over it. Um, but it's an incredibly big part of uh, the world's global emissions, actually. On the other hand, of course, it is a big food crop, uh, so perhaps that's not so surprising. But it, again, it's that thing, it's a bit like peat, it's the, um, it's the growing underwater and the anaerobic conditions. Um, it, it, uh, yeah, some estimates are that it is the main source of man-made uh, emissions rather than uh, animal emissions. Um, and it's certainly made worse by heat. Countries like India, uh, for example, where they're growing a lot of rice, will produce an awful lot more methane from their rice production than China or, um, or a slightly cooler country. Um, anyway, so, but I'm not going to go too deeply into that, but just so you, you know, I can see the complexities and it's very hard to unpick the statistics as to exactly what comes from livestock. Um, but let's be clear, ruminants, and that's not just cows, it's also sheep and goats, are, uh, are a really big part of our world population and they are a big, big source of emissions. We have about a billion cattle worldwide and they are the, the biggest source of, of, of methane. Um, and you can see the breakdown per country there. Um, and here we are, breakdown of emissions. Again, almost 40% from enteric fermentation. All that stuff belching out, back and front, uh, and so on. And the manure, the feed, uh, and so on. So livestock is a, is, a, is a big issue. And so the question is, should we eat meat? And this uh, analysis comes up with uh, a kilogram of carbon dioxide per kilogram of meat consumed. And again, I don't suppose it's a surprise really when you look at it, you know, it, it reflects the fact that you're having to grow the cereal to feed the animals and so on. But anything that's just pure vegetable that we ne eat neat is relatively low. What I was surprised by was that actually lamb comes out higher than beef. So um, that was a bit of a surprise. There are other issues to do with beef production. It's very water intensive, um, very land intensive, um, and so on. It takes much more. Um, if we can do questions at the end, that would be great if that's OK. Um, but just to, to sort of get livestock in proportion. So, so that question that's raised in the film, Cowspiracy, is livestock actually a bigger issue than fossil fuels? I think on balance, uh, and I, I'm having to say here, I cannot give you an absolutely clear answer on this, but I, don't, I think it, is quite, it seems fairly sure that fossil fuels are our main target. They are the, are the main source of our, um, our emissions. But certainly um, uh, our agricultural is a large part of it, and of that, uh, livestock is a major, major proportion as well. So forest fuel, fossil fuels responsible for about 60% of all emissions Deforestation, 18%, and most of that deforestation will be to do with uh, cattle production, uh, uh, livestock production, and then animal agriculture, another 14 to 18%. So it's, I think what, what that film Cowspiracy did, it was really useful in waking people up to the fact this isn't just about fossil fuels. You know, actually what we do, what we consume, what we put in our meat, uh, in, our, in our mouths, sorry, is, uh, is really, really relevant. Actually, and I have to say, good news, it turned my son vegetarian. He was a, he was a three metre day man, and uh, it's cut my food bills by half. So uh, I'm very pleased with it. So if anybody hasn't seen Cowspiracy, do see it. Um, but of course, the scientists have got, got going on this. They're, again, looking for that technological fix. So, you know, can we change what we put into cows to make it so that they produce less methane? Apparently, basil is, is good at cutting down the, the stuff. But we're also looking at mango pips and, and citrus fruit and all the rest of it, you know, what can we feed animals so that we can keep farming <coughs> livestock but produce less methane? We can strap methane capture on them and we can, we can put the animals together so that we collect their manure and then turn it into biogas. And actually, if, anybody, if you look at anaerobic digesters around the UK, an awful lot of our farms now have these uh, and they will use it for, for um, fuel on the farm. 
Okay, but beyond all that, I think, you know, to me, I, I, as I say, I haven't come up with a really clear answer on this, on vegetarianism, veganism, but I think there are many other issues to consider. And first of all, the, given the proportions, we cannot sustainably produce enough meat for 9 billion humans uh, to eat meat as we eat it. And the developing world, the global south, is heading towards the level of meat consumption that we have. And this is just fundamentally unsustainable. We don't have the land, we don't have the water, we don't have the everything. We don't have the phosphorus, we don't have the everything to make this possible. We also have, of course, endless uh, health issues, antibiotic resistance. Cattle takes 28 times the land of pork or chickens and so on. It's a really uh, poor use of our land indeed, uh, water scarcity and then of course, I mean actually I went to visit some friends recently who've started sheep farming up in Derbyshire and they, it's very, it's almost a, a small holding, it's a very unintensive project, product, uh, project for them but they already, you know, their sheep are, because they're trotting around uh, several fields in, it, but they use, in their own manure, they're getting hoof disease, they're having to be, um, you know, treated for infections all the time. I hadn't realised that this was just such a prolific problem. You can't, you could, you know, and this is really not intensive farming, um, but they're having to use some really nasty chemicals on a very regular basis just to stop hoof, hoof problems amongst the animals. So, you know, there are lots, lots of issues to be considered there. Okay, but what I have to tell you is that there is a completely different argument and you will see it on the web. And it comes down to this issue about how we get carbon out of the air. And many researchers uh, and scientists even have said that our biggest hope is to restore our degraded grasslands. And you will see, you know, 5 billion hectares of hope. Most would put it at 3.5 billion or whatever. But we have these hugely degraded lands around the area. And grassland, if you think back to right at the beginning when we were talking about how you get organic carbon in the soil, grass can be a very effective carbon pump. It grows, it takes carbon out of the soil, animals come and munch it, it sloughs off its roots, you leave it alone, the grass grows again. You repeat performance, it can work as a very good, efficient uh, pump. And so many people are saying, actually, we need, if we're going to restore this amount of land, we need animals to do this. We can't go around and mow it, for God's sake, you know. And so their argument is, um, and it's, it's certainly worth looking at it, um, is that what we need to do is mimic what wild herds do in, in the savannas of, of Africa. We need to, what they do is clump together because they're worried about protection, they're worried about lions, whatever else, uh, attacking them, wildebeest and so on. And then they, they will intensively graze an area. They will dung, they will urinate uh, and so on on the area. They will trample the dead grass and then they move on. And they may not come back for months, if not years, um, and so on. And they move on. And so that's this, this process. So they've, they've chomped off the grass, grass sheds its roots, and then it's left a long while to grow back again, become lush grass. So this is what they see as, as very much a hope for the planet. Um, and just, of course, whereas trees can have sort of 50-50 above and below ground, grass can have as much as four times below the ground as, as above. So this is, this is their argument. <coughs> and I really would, you know, it's good to see, to see the other side of the argument. I would particularly recommend Graham Sait, who does a half-hour TED Talk, and he's very, very watchable and very passionate on the subject. Um, Tony Lovell is very interesting. Carbon Cowboys is just great fun. It's a couple of American farmers uh, whose farms were virtually going bankrupt until they discovered this way of livestock management and they managed to really improve the fertility on their soil. They stopped using fertilisers on their pasture land and so on. Alan Savory is the, really, the main protagonist and he's somebody who, who I think he admits himself he's got some things wrong in his past. He is the one who advised the Kenyan government a few decades ago to cull elephants. So, uh, you know, he has a bit, of a bit of a track record. But he is really passionate. And these pictures come from him. And these are, I think, from Arizona, Mexico and Zimbabwe. And the interesting thing is that these are nearby. These are connecting bits of land. So you'd think they were completely from different countries, taken on different seasons and so on. And his argument is 
actually you need the he's got this these results he's made these la these lands lush by using livestock by in fact the more livestock he's put on the more lush they've become so it kind of turns the whole argument on its head um, now he doesn't quite explain exactly how you get over that and i can uh, what what i can, the only thing i can think is that certainly in the early days i mean you can't put hundreds of cattle on this land and expect them to survive unless you're feeding them cereals or you know other crops from somewhere else and he doesn't really explain that which makes me slightly suspicious of, of the the argument um, but it does you know there are good people saying that this is kind of what we need to do it's certainly if we're going to stop the, the increase of the Sahel, which is, um, or the, the Sahara into the Sahel, it's at the moment we're losing about 12 million hectares uh, every year. Uh, so we have to stop that des diversification of uh, desertification. Um, and so I must admit, because of, because of reading of this, I, I, I'm still, I think the point is, it's not a one size fits all, is the only uh, thing I can come up with. Um, Carbon sequestration uh, has a mitigation, or this is what the IPCC says, the International Panel on Climate Change. They recognise that we can get carbon back down into the soil. They put it at a fairly moderate one to four billion tonnes of CO2 per year. When you think at the moment um, our carbon, uh, our sink, our soil sink is about 1,500 um, gigatons. Um, and I'm, they again say about 70% of this potential, they think, is in the global south. And I, I, again, it's a question I haven't been able to really answer, but is that accepting the, com the economic constraints in the north? You know, um, we have very depleted car soils in the global north, you know, in North America, in Europe, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, Ukraine, Russia, uh, and so on. It, are we really, you know, is it, is it, are we putting the load on the global south simply because it's easier, because we, it's harder for us to change our system? Um, and it also adds certain caveats. It, this, this is only going to work if we are not using nitrogen fertilizer to develop the grass, if you don't then convert it to crops, if you manage those animals very effectively in that way, that livestock management, herding them around as if they were in the wild, uh, and so on. Um, and certainly not overgrazing. So they're recognising there's a potential, but not going overboard on it. So, I, I mean, to me, basically, I have given up meat. All <laughs> I can tell you, I do, I do, do, uh, do have dairy products, organic. Um, but um, you know, to me, this is the, the sort of a small and very easy contribution to the climate change uh, issue. Um, but I think the main, the main things that we need to focus on are no more deforestation um, and protecting and replanting where we can and really aggressively more than where we can. We need to find those places. Um, we need to cut the chemicals. Um, we need to mi minimise cereal input. And generally that means less intensive farming. We've got to change our farming practices. Um, and we've got to uh, stop desertification. Whether, uh, the bit that I'm unclear about is whether animals are needed for that. That's what I, I, I can't say, given the sort of completely conflicting points of view. Um, and I think it does come down to whether that can be done without giving cereal crops to animals. Um, but uh, there we go. But anyway, the good news is in the UK, we are eating far less meat. Um, apparently about 12% of us now follow either a vegetarian or a vegan diet. And amongst the young people, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's really catching on, uh, about 20% flexitarianism on the rise, uh, and 20% of new product launches are vegetarian. So we, we're, um, in fact, we're, we're pretty high compared to many European countries. So, just, I suppose, just to, 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 to say, I mean, on a sort of slightly more reflective note, I mean, I think, I think it is that, I think perhaps of all the talks I've done, I found this perhaps the most shocking really, maybe because I know more about the NG issue and so on, but I, it's that whole thing about we haven't valued what we haven't understood, and even when we have understood it, finally, we have still not valued it, we've still carried on desecrating what actually our lives and our health depends on. And uh, again, I suppose it comes back to that issue that we were discussing during the break. It's finding uh, an economic 
a, a market force way of changing our production is what we have to do now. We don't have time to mess around. So, you know, each of us have to think about what we consume. You know, it's that thing about consume real food instead of food-like products. Uh, think about where you buy uh, and so on. Stop putting all the money into the hands of very big companies uh, and go for the smaller producers and the smaller um, sales uh, force and so on. But, um, but that's not really a long-term, that's not a long-term solution. We have to find a way of protecting these assets that are absolutely integral to our life that do not rely on market forces because we, the market forces will change over time uh, and we have to find a way of making sure that they are secure for ourselves and our future generations. So there we are, that's me on my hobby horse. Mm -hmm. But uh, there we go and I'm doing this for Solar Aid. So thank you very much everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you.